So in the next part of our session, what we're really going to focus in on, using kind of the ideas that we talked about this morning, really thinking about supporting teachers to conduct interactive read-alouds that really get... <laughs> it's hard to transition after lunch. It's so tough. <laughs> What we're really going to focus on is supporting teachers to use interactive read-alouds in ways that really support students to engage in meaningful science and literacy learning. And so one of the ways we're going to do this is part of the work that we, Anne-Marie and I have been engaged in with the Multiple Literacies and Project-Based Learning Group is designing a particular support for teachers to engage students in read-alouds. And what we call these, um, we call these interactive reading guides. So what Anne-Marie is passing out to you is three examples of interactive reading guides from our units that we have designed to, um, to support teachers to interact particular texts for particular purposes. And so you're gonna get um, three different ones to see. They all come from third grade units of instruction. And what you'll see on the very first page of each guide is just kind of a brief description that really situates um, the text that's presented within that unit of instruction. And it also tells you, I believe, the particular PEs or the ideas that are focused on um, in those units and that would be emphasized in that particular text. And so when I talk about an interactive reading guide, what you'll see when you look at those is the way that we prepare these for teachers is we put the student text exactly as it appears to students on the left hand side of the guide and then ideas to support discussion of the ideas in, of, in the text on the right hand side. So that's just kind of an orientation to the three guides that Anne-Marie is going to pass out for you to examine. Often there's some orienting information at the top that you'll see in some of the guides as well that really tries to situate the text within the unit of instruction for the teacher too. And so the three texts that Amory is passing around come from two of the different units of instruction. One of them, I, know, I think the first one that she passed out is um, called The Koala, A Success Story. It comes from our Unit 1, Why Do We See So Many Squirrels But No Stegosauruses? So does the Bacteria, Good or Bad text that Anne-Marie is also passing out. So both of those come from that first unit of instruction. And then the third text that Anne-Marie is passing out is called From Water Squirter to Super Soaker, How Lonnie George Johnson Changed the Water Games. And this text comes from a unit of instruction called um, how can we design fun moving toys that other kids can build? So really focusing on those ideas of engineering design. And in that unit, the students are working to design their own moving toys. And so what we'd like to give you some time to do as you kind of analyze these interactive reading guides for the ways in which they might be supportive of teachers and the kinds of things they include is we would like you to skim through these. You could choose one that you really want to focus on or you may want to look at um, all three of them and kind of compare across. But what we want you to be thinking about as you review on your own and then to discuss in your tables is what are the types of prompts included in the guides? What are they designed to engage the readers in doing? In what ways do you think these kinds of tools, when I say that I mean interactive reading guides, might support teachers to address both science and ELA learning goals. What additional features might make interactive reading guides, at least the ones you see here, more helpful to teachers? And what supports might elementary teachers need to create their own interactive reading guides? So kind of connecting back to that conversation that we were having earlier, as we analyze these tools, thinking about who might be best suited to support the creation of interactive reading guides to support teachers. Is this work that we really want to engage teachers in? In what ways might we want to support this work? Are, or do our curriculum developers more well suited to engage in these things? So that's a conversation that we can continue later on. So I want us to take about um, 15 minutes to do an, an initial exploration of these guides. You, like I said, you could choose one that you want to look really closely at based on topic or you could kind of look across and then use these questions to guide your discussion at your table and then we'll have a conversation with the whole group. Any questions for me before you get started? Okay. 
So just a final note is we're thinking of all of these texts as being conducted in the context of an interactive read aloud. What so that means is um, that it's called, we use the term interactive because the assumption is that the class together in interaction with one another and the teacher is constructing the meaning of this text. We call it read aloud because the expectation is that the teacher typically is reading the text aloud so that we don't need to be concerned about decoding issues. Everyone can have access to the same content. They, they are not, and let okay. me explain that. These are texts that we constructed. Okay. And the reason we did is for ease of being able to share that with you. So we do use trade books in our work. Um, for example, we, have, we actually have a full biography of Lonnie Johnson that's a trade book. We have a book called No Monkeys, No Chocolate that we use. We do use trade books. However, we didn't have multiple copies, and so we thought, well, no, no, when you said you pick your favorite, so I just went into the Ann Arbor Public Schools and I thought, oh, I'll pick one that we have. And oh, no, no, I'm has. sorry, we needed to clarify. <laughs> These are passages that okay. we've written okay. no to go along with the units. <laughs> yes? How does this stand in the overall instructional piece? So this is just like one piece of science instruction or, or oh. LA construction? Absolutely okay. right. So um, you'll see that there's a little descriptor that tells you, okay. like midway through, students participate in, uh, and in each case it tells you where the text is situated in the unit, but uh, you should assume that the students have been making their own observations, they've been doing their own investigations, they've read other texts, they've been writing, they've been drawing models, so this is but one element of the curriculum. We hope that some of this will be helpful. Like I, we're thinking about like James's question this morning. Do you just give the students the text? And well, you'll notice that there's a particular, I don't want to say a formula, but there is a pattern to the way we construct these interactive guides. And part of what we're inviting you to do is to identify what that pattern is. What do you notice across these three guides? What seems to be in common? And then what's unique as a function of what the demands of the text are. All right, let's get started with our debrief kind of discussion. Um, I heard some really helpful things. One of the things that I heard was that one approach that teachers might take when using a guide like this would, might even be to having multiple readings of a particular text using kind of a different lens through different readings, right? So we may really, really emphasize um, this focus on scientific practices or engineering design through one reading and perhaps 
through another reading, we may look really specifically at perhaps Lonnie Johnson's character traits and how that drives kind of his story. So whereas we have all, a lot of the suggestions um, integrated so that you see prompts that are really specific to targeting students thinking, their literacy thinking, their reading, particular ELA goals, you also see other prompts that are much more geared towards supporting students to interpret disciplinary core ideas or to think about or engage in scientific practices. And so there are a variety of ways that teachers can think about that in the process of enactment. And certainly, we encourage the teachers who have used these tools to add their own prompts and make connections to things that they know their own students have experienced or things that they're interested in. So when you see a guide like this, we would never suggest to a teacher, this is exactly what you need to say. You need to stop at exactly these places. It's also an intuitive tool that can be built upon or modified as a teacher uses it. But what we'd like to do now is to hear some of your thinking about what you noticed and what you talked about with your groups, because I know there were several really rich conversations that went in different directions. So we can kind of start anywhere, right? If you want to share with us what kinds of prompts that you noticed, so some of the patterns or the things that struck you about the different prompts in the guide, that's great. What do they engage readers in doing? How are they helpful, do you think, to teachers and learners? And what are some things that you might add or change if you were using something like this with your teachers? Who would like to get us started? Yes? Something I, I noticed right away across all three is uh, very clearly, uh, very clear attention to critiquing and analyzing the text. So lots of talk about the author. So attention to critiquing and analyzing the text, maybe what were the author's reasons for sharing a particular kind of information or idea? What are some other things that you noticed in the guides? So as they were doing that, they were also doing it in very specific ways to pull up the science ideas that are necessary. What else did you notice about the prompts that were included? They all started with um, a way to engage the students and connect them with the things they already knew mm -hmm. and find interest. So trying to support students to make connections. So this is not a situation where we're bringing a text in front of students and saying, okay, today we're going to read about Lonnie Johnson and we're going to learn about him. But thinking about how can we go ahead and start thinking about how we're going to connect this text to other things that we've been doing in our unit of instruction and why are we reading this text in the first place? Yes? There was a lot of there were a lot of open-ended questions and processing going on that weren't just asking the students to repeat specific facts that they had just heard, but rather to have discussions, to come up with reasoning, to find evidence for things, um, to make connections to things. So trying to engage students in more higher order thinking versus just asking those kind of right there questions that we would talk about as ELA teachers. Yes, James. Overall, we know is the alignment to the essentials. We discussed the fact that one person's IRA may be different from another. Mm -hmm. Many of us do this with sticky notes and books. Yes, absolutely. Okay, what is that? What is that? So, so, um, so when we talk about IRAs, we're talking about interactive read aloud. So that's a good acronym. He read that. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Miranda. No, you're good. So that's a good acronym for us all. IRAs is interactive read alouds. And then um, another thing that I think James mentioned from the posting from somebody that's joining us virtually is that teachers enact these in different ways, right? And we spoke to that just a little bit a few minutes ago of thinking that while these guys provide ideas, this is gonna unfold differently in different teachers' classrooms, right? They're gonna have different things to connect some of these ideas to. They know that their students may have different experiences from the students in another classroom. And so, or they may be able to connect it interdisciplinar interdisciplinarily, maybe? Um, to, is that a word? To other, you get the idea. <laughs> to other topics, maybe other things they've been focusing on in ELA or other parts of their day. Um, in addition to that, I had another really good idea. What was the last part that you said? Um, oh, the sticky notes. Yes. What would you say? I was just wondering if you could read that whole thing 
Okay, go for it. Overall, we noticed the alignment to the essentials. We discussed the fact that one person's IRA may be different from another. Many of us do this with sticky notes and books. So I think what that part speaks to is that when teachers are planning their own interactive read-alouds, especially with trade books, one really useful tool for planning is to post those questions that you have that you want to present to students on a sticky note so that it's right there on the page of your book where you want to ask that particular question. Yes? We were having some um, conversation here about kind of, we didn't use this word, but the bias that you bring to the text, right? Because we were saying that the folks with the science lens would have leaned towards only the more science related and in an ELA, it's whatever you bring. And so it's, it was a nice marriage of the two of them together, which I think probably brings um, a real richness to the classroom. So. But it was clear which ones were a little mm -hmm. bit more science related and which ones were a little bit more ELA related. Mm -hmm. so. Yes. And I'll piggyback on that because I think that's why this is not an individual template that you fill out. This is done in a group because we all come with a different sure. ones and they have that true marriage and that's what I appreciated about this. I'm like, wow, because there can be a lot of pages to read in the science and there's so much information. I think you did a great job of narrowing it down to specific the specifics that we wanted to have in regards yep. to science, but then we really did look and we talked about the essentials and the points that we want to hit there as well. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, I think that's a really important point too, because it's not the case that Amory and I go off and design interactive reading guides without being in collaboration with the science experts on our team, right? It's a constant conversation. And so even as we're doing that curriculum design work too for our project, the science experts are always at the table proposing, well, I think they really need to go deeper, like you said, on this particular topic, and we really need to be emphasizing these ideas. So I think that idea of bringing multiple expertise, multiple levels of expertise and different types to the table in thinking about supporting these kind of integrated, interactive read aloud discussions is really important. Yes? I think it might be helpful to include exemplar student answers mm. to some of the teacher prompts. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be an additional feature. Right. Would be some yes. examples of students' names. Say. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yes. Um, this uh, has the ability to make thinking visible for kids, and it also teaches the teacher to make thinking visible. So when it asks questions about um, what do you think Lonnie had to think about differently when he changed the purpose of the design? Or think about what you've been learning about balanced and unbalanced forces? Or um, based on what you've heard so far, would you describe Lonnie Johnson? I'm sorry, how would you describe Lonnie Johnson? All these things make the thinking process you hope kids are doing while reading visible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's yeah. a fantastic thing. Kind of making it clear the kinds of thinking that you're hoping the students are They're engaging in. Right. Yep, exactly. Yes. Well, and kind of going along with that, we were wondering how might you capture some of that thinking? Would you be creating, you know, class-generated charts? If they were older kids, would they be recording some thinking in their mm -hmm. science notebooks and then sharing it with their peers? Because um, I think that's an important piece too. Is is a way to capture that thinking in the moment as you're going through this process? Absolutely. We actually do have, in some of our interactive read alouds, we have places that, where the students pause and they make an entry. Okay. Um, so, yes, we would agree with you. Yes. Um, so, I actually appreciate the fact that um, these plans weren't necessarily um, super dense. So, you could have included, um, you know, prompts for the yeah. teacher to add to a chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could have included um, uh, participation structures for students, you know, instead of just turn and toss or, mm -hmm. or asking, you yes. know, the class, the entire group aloud. So I, I am kind of like going back and forth about whether, you know, I want to make mm -hmm. a suggestion because I like that it's so, um, it's as minimal as it can be, I guess. Um, but I do think that for the first page, um, one that I would add is um, there's the the learning goal for the mm -hmm. lesson. So and that's the the about content. And so perhaps for someone who isn't um, <coughs> who's got the lens of science, but not necessarily the lens of literacy, um, writing a little bit about 
the reading process goal mm -hmm. or, or what it is about reading that they're going to um, teach the students. Yeah, that's great. Would be helpful. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, one thing that I thought was significant was that um, problem solving comes out as a quick and dirty strategy. It's not just a long pondering session. Mm -hmm. And I think when they're asking questions like, what will make a better super soaker? How will it make a better blast? Johnson was working on an engineering design to solve a problem. What problem was he trying to solve? Those questions are asking you to interact with your brain about problem solving as the student over and over again fast. Mm -hmm. And it's not generally how we talk about problem solving. And right. so it makes a flexibility in the brain of, oh, oh, like problem solving is something I do and I can do and I'm comfortable with. It just puts it in there again and mm -hmm. again and again. Yeah. Well, let's see. So let's just open kind of the question of, I want to revisit your thinking from a little bit earlier about this, what supports my elementary teachers need to create their own interactive reading guides, or where you think that responsibility falls if you think reading guides would be particularly helpful. To what level might teachers be involved in this kind of work, and what kinds of supports would they need? Yes? I work with the district where the curriculum director actually set up days where the staff, grade level staff, would come in and they would develop these tools all okay. together. Mm -hmm. And so it allowed them that, that opportunity because I think that we always talk about we don't have time to write, but we're not intentional. Mm -hmm. Even the professional development that we're offering to teachers is not around these types. And I think that would be helpful. Yes? I think the act of constructing them with the teachers mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Because how deep do they have to go on their knowledge of the standards to then decide where we kind of pull up here and intentional? So what kind of prompts are really going to provide the opportunity for rich discussion, but also so that that rich discussion is connecting back to those important science ideas and standards? Yes, James. I think you'd really want to, you know, read through it more than once. I mean, you, you want to read through it one time thinking about it with your mm -hmm. ELA lens. What is, what is my ELA goal at this moment? And how might I get at that with this particular piece of reading? Mm -hmm. And then go back through and say, wait, what are my science goals at this moment? And how might I actually get at those goals asking the right prompt? And then somehow, like, you, like we were talking about here, somehow bring those together in some real uh, substantive types of questions. So really thinking about the possibility of going through each time, right, the value with different lenses. Mm -hmm. So a first read and analysis based on what can we really target here with science, right? And then a second read of what, what are the really productive opportunities for ELA? We have a, I can, can please, I just add yep. A third? I can imagine a third that sweep that would be, what do I know my students have already been mm. introduced to? What prior knowledge should they be able to bring to this by virtue of where this text is in my unit of study? Absolutely. And I think to add on to that, having a tool, like as you, if you would like, you know, have training teachers to do this, some kind of evaluation tool, like practice on something like this, fill it out, like, okay, where in this did it do this? Where in this did it do this? So then they know when they're doing their own, there's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. There are a few more hands, yes. Um, it makes me think so many of our districts haven't adopted new materials, like, because they're not ready yet. Like, you guys right. are working on the multiple literacy stuff, and if if they're going to create these guides, they have to have something to start with. Mm -hmm. So we saw this morning how hard it is to like pick what a good reading might look like in the first place. And now like we're saying, okay, here's here's a good set of readings. Let's make some more tools around that. So that's like another step. Mm -hmm. And the, if they have good reading materials to start with, this they're they're ready to do this. Right. Yeah. If they're not, they can't even think about it. Mm -hmm. yet. Right. And that's where I was kind of going with this thinking too. Is like the shared experience of all working from the same book really grows that conversation with, through the collegiality of working together and saying like, well, this is the question that I made and this is the mm -hmm. questions that I made. Like, then it starts to have these conversations across the grade level where um, if you're just picking books, you know, I'm doing this one, I'm doing this one, who can really value those, those levels of questions? So really, right. even if it's just a couple of common resources, mm -hmm. um, it would be amazing to just start Right, yes. I think even before we can get to this cross 
conversation is really thinking about step one, thinking about the unit questions, your unit driving questions. That's just step one. I mean, I think that's, that's where a lot of it starts with. Like, how do I come up with that unit driving question? And I think that goes back to some of the questions around whether teachers have access to curriculum materials and units that are already designed and ready that come with those driving questions and so they already have that starting place versus whether teachers are in the position of trying to construct their own driving questions and engage in that complex work of really figuring out how to design a coherent unit of instruction designed around a driving question that's specific to focusing on supporting students to figure out a phenomena. I don't have a perfect answer for you, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes. And I think along that line, we need to support teachers and where this, where this fits into their instructional picture. So right. where, you know, what, uh, how much of this is, um, is driving what they're instructing. You know, um, this is, for some teachers, this would, might be it. Right. Like this would sure. be all they're doing is for a science instruction. And so we need to help teachers see what all the different elements that need to happen for that continual learning process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And James, you want to add something? And then we'll move on to telling kind of a backwards design way of think how we think through putting together some of these guides. There are lots of interactions going on online here. Uh, some of them want to know more about uh, this idea of Connecting student answers to questions to make the thinking more visible, mm -hmm. um, and then going back and revisiting those answers throughout the reading and rereading, uh, as well as making connections to different texts. Someone else suggests that they they love the idea of giving uh, grade level teams time to construct mm -hmm. these. Um, that teachers really need that, and that it has to be a central office priority to give teachers collaborative time to do so and that would bring value back to teacher professionalism as well. Mm -hmm. Others suggest, uh, have you recorded these interactive guides in classroom use? Yes. Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. A video of this process would be awesome for teachers to be able to view. Seeing how teacher facilitates this discussion would be helpful. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. And you do have those as well. We after. do. We do. Yes. Yep. Um, and then, uh, this is a comment to someone else online, but anyway, Fair H, uh, I'm sure there are others, but uh, these are from the MLPBL project in the third grade are in efficacy study. Mm -hmm. Lots of video, but I don't know how many are allowed to be used <coughs> due to the study. None yet. I think this would be a product, uh, product of our learning. Uh, could be rehearsals. Uh, for Great. No, that's all very, very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think at this point we can come back to these discussions, but we want to talk through just a little bit about how we think about kind of the process of creating interactive reading guides similar to the ones that you reviewed. So some key steps that we think about in planning for interactive read alouds comes back to this idea of identifying learning goals, right? We've talked about that quite a bit today. One of the very first things that we want to be thinking about is what are our learning goals? Identifying learning goals that are clear and specific. Like we've discussed, this can include and should include in this context both ELA and science learning goals. Another really important part of that that we've also talked about today is selecting and analyzing a text that's aligned to those learning goals. It's sufficiently challenging for students and rich enough to support a classroom discussion among students. And so we have these arrows here because we think that these are really an interplay, right? And so you have to kind of know what your learning goals are and what you're moving toward, but you also have to be able to select and analyze a text that's gonna align to those learning goals and that's also rich enough for discussion. So we think of those as kind of happening simultaneously. Then you have to kind of segment the text, right? Think about where you're going to pause in a discussion that's going to support students to build an understanding of the text and the key ideas. And also, as we've also, you've also talked about, is planning those higher order discussion questions that consistently support the learning goals, that take advantage of the text features and the text that you've selected, and then invite a deep interaction with the text for students. 
And one thing that we really want to emphasize when we talk about selecting a text is the choice of text affects a lot of things. And I think that's clear based on the things we've talked about too, right? Your text really impacts the goals that you can have and the goals that you'll be able to meet based on that context. It also impacts student interest. So how interested students are going to be in that particular text and those ideas. And it also impacts the questions that a teacher can pose that are going to generate useful discussion with a class. And then do you want to talk a little bit about how we think about the kinds of questions that are designed? Do you want to wait and give those out? Um, in a little bit, yes. Okay. Okay. So we were just trying to think about, well, what are some other um, what other knowledge would be useful to you as you have conversations with your teachers? And it brought us to some of the kinds of discourse moves. And we know that you're familiar probably with accountable talk, or you've been introduced to um, the equip rubric that has different forms of talk. So there's no one taxonomy, obviously, but these are discourse moves that we have found helpful when Miranda was commenting about the, or you made the observation about the open-ended nature of the questions. So that's what guides our thinking is, all right, so these are the ways in which teachers can elicit talk. You can certainly ask students to retrieve information. That would be really locating information in the text. That's not a, a bad thing. That's an important thing, particularly in ELA. We think a lot about that. But we also are interested in supporting students to relate the information they're encountering in the text with their prior experience or to offer personal reactions to the text. So those kinds of invitations. Another discourse move is explain. You know, what are, what are the kinds of questions that we can use that elicit explanation from students, which we very much associate with science learning. And of course, the important issue of inference that we started our day talking about. What are some questions that we can embed that ask the students to really make connections among the ideas in the text, whether it's uh, within sentences, across sentences, across larger chunks of the text. There are also questions that can engage students in predicting. There's another cluster of connecting, comparing, and contrasting. And then finally, questions that invite the student to evaluate, like evaluating some of the decisions that Lonnie Johnson made, or evaluating the evidence that the scientists have for why the koala might have survived when those 23 other species uh, went extinct at the same time that the koala uh, was, was a, why is the koala a survivor and the rest of the organisms died out? So if we were to recap what we're trying to support in the design of these interactive reading guides, we would say that we hope that the discussion moves are supporting the students to build coherence, that they're providing opportunities for the teacher to scaffold comprehension, sometimes by looking back at particular terms of phrase or looking back at an illustration, that the teacher is using the discussion to focus attention on some of the text features, and finally, that they're making it real by making the connections to real world experiences or to prior knowledge that the students have. I think that this is pretty redundant with the information that we've been talking about. One thing that we know uh, can be tricky sometimes at the third grade level, perhaps particularly, is avoiding digressions. Uh, what we do see is that as students have repeated experiences with these discussions and realize that they're going to be held accountable to the information of the text, in the text, you see less of that. So I've, I've certainly been struck by that because I've observed text-based discussions for many decades in my work and I've really been struck by how easy it is for children to digress and to build on things that, you know, experiences that they've had that have nothing to do with the information in the text. But what's interesting is that children do learn that, no, what we're doing now is 
we're constructing the information in the text. And when I have something that's relevant to that, then that's a good thing to bring to the discussion. But I'm not going to go off and talk about the scuba diving trip that I went on last year, <laughs> just because we're reading about coral reefs. Miranda, what do you think? Is there anything more we need to? No, I don't think so. OK. You'll notice, hopefully, that we are inviting, and this is very much an ELA standard, inviting students to provide evidence for their ideas, returning to the text. We do think it's very appropriate for teachers to supply information if there is a gap in the cohesion, and just having a useful bit of information could help the student to close that gap. We think that's very appropriate. We recognize that acknowledging student contributions and revoicing their contributions are helpful discourse moves as well. Uh, these are particularly important to increasing engagement. So when a teacher identifies, you know, oh, Mike had that really interesting idea this morning, we're going to build on that, Erica added to it, identifying children's, children for the specific contributions that they make can be a very useful means of heightening um, motivation, engagement, interest. This is kind of a repetition of some of the issues that we talked about this morning when we were looking at the text analysis tool. Hopefully what you're seeing is a relationship between the text analysis tool and the discourse moves, right? These should be working together. I think we can move on to the next I slide think, for this. Yeah, let's do that. So another aspect of this instruction, and you'll see some of this represented in those guides, is thinking about the launch. So with the uh, coral reefs, for example, we could have started by showing a video clip, right, of a coral reef <coughs> ecosystem. So you have many choices that you can make with respect to uh, taking out a map that shows where Australia is on the globe or having, in this case, we have the students look more closely at the, uh, oh, thank you, <laughs> at the, um, so there you see the jellyfish to which the coral polyp is compared. Then with respect to the discussion itself, you know, the, we're thinking about what the text analysis, what our own research, these are topics that we talked about this morning. And what our learning, oh, sorry, you, you and I it. are now working, okay. Go backward too. Okay. There you go. Yep. Uh, so these are working synergistically to help you to think about how to construct the guide. And then finally, and something that we have uh, tried to press ourselves to get better at, is planning an exit activity. So it isn't just, all right, let's close your books, we're moving on. But rather, how do we kind of punctuate this experience that we've had reading? What, what exit activity? And also, how can that exit activity provide the teacher some evaluative information about what the students took away from this experience? So that, with that, you have kind of the full, the full package uh, that we think of when we put together this kind of interactive reading. So, just any questions? Yeah, I think we're just ready to, we're going to move into vocabulary mm -hmm. now, but we wanted to see if there are any other observations or questions or clarifications. Anything from our online community? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, lunch. <laughs> oh my, we really are behind. <laughs> Okay, so moving right along, um, we were several times in our June meeting, this issue of vocabulary came up. Do you need to stretch? Does, do people want to stand and stretch yeah. for a moment? Yeah. Let's do yeah, that. Let's take a five minute break. Okay, let's yeah. take a five minute break and be back at two o'clock. As I was mentioning before we took a little break, 
We know that uh, vocabulary has come up, actually even in today's discussion, we've been talking about vocabulary. So we wanted to designate a bit of time, but we're also going to budget our time so that we um, allow time around 3.15 for some feedback and purpose setting for tomorrow, although Mary will pick up with that uh, tomorrow morning. But uh, we want to leave you with some questions to think about. So, but we have, we have uh, some decent time here that we can be thinking about this issue of vocabulary. It's a particularly complex topic, interestingly enough. Um, and so we wanted to give it a little bit of justice. But we thought it might be helpful to start off by asking you, what do your teachers currently do with, with regard to teaching vocabulary? Do you know? Is it possible to characterize their practice, or is it like all over the place? Do you want elementary or secondary? Oh. Which content area? So start anywhere. Do you want to go first? Please. I was just saying, our school, um, actually, our district, there's a heavy emphasis on word walls. OK. And I, I watched the June video yesterday and loved the statement about, about what word walls, how ineffective they are unless you're actually doing things with the words that are on the wall. Yeah. Um, so yeah, word walls. OK. All right, so that's one practice. Please. Okay, Erica. So I would say that um, there's nothing systematic, even across an individual building. But there is some, you know, some new information or some take up around um, Tanya's sequence for teaching vocabulary. So you know, the I, I think what people are starting to pick up on a little bit more is the distributed review and then um, the assessment of vocabulary. Okay. So just a little bit of, I, two years worth of PD around that. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. This is a helpful uh, sampling. So there are a few things that we wanted to say with respect to the complexity of vocabulary. It's um, one is that we do learn word meanings incrementally. And so as we have repeated exposures to words and we experience those words in different contexts, we do come to a deeper understanding of the meaning of the word. There's also the complexity of what does it mean to know a word, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Another piece of the challenge of vocabulary is the polysemous nature of words. So I'll take the word. <laughs> I can demonstrate this in one moment. So think about the word key. What are all the meanings of the word key? K-E-Y. What do you think of? All right, a key that opens a lock. A map legend, which is a key. The key idea, exactly. An island. Good for you. Good for you. Don't even get me started with the word ran because that is really fabulous. Or the word run, right? You're going to make a run for it. A run on the bank. Uh, he's going to run for president. She's going to run for president. What? I know, I know. I can't help it. I love that word. It's my favorite example. I have a run in my stocking. It's my favorite example of a polysemous word. All right. Word meanings are interrelated. So that's the interesting thing, and that's why it's so helpful if we don't think about teaching vocabulary words, but concepts. Because then you can use multiple words to help you to enrich that concept. So that's another little key for us. And word knowledge is heterogeneous. And what I mean by that is that we have words that we understand when we hear them. We have words we understand when we read them. We use certain words in our speech, and we have the words we use in our writing. So very often, the words that we 
um, we, may, we probably know a larger number of vocabulary words in spoken language because all we have to do is make sense in the context, right? That's how we can interpret that word. So often I can rely on your facial expression. I can rely on your tone of voice. I can rely on the context. So that's why our vocabulary knowledge from our listening vocabulary is much more expansive than our knowledge of vocabulary that we read or the words that we choose to use in speech. So I know for a fact that there are vocabulary words that I can figure out the meaning in reading, but I would have no idea how to use it in my own expressive speech. I just don't have enough confidence that I would use the word correctly, right? Because there are so many nuances to, to vocabulary. And then, of course, that is going to be limiting in my it's, it limits what we use in our writing as well. So let me just stop and see if there are any questions about these observations about vocabulary. <coughs> so our Michigan standards actually do haul out vocabulary as one of the important standards, vocabulary acquisition and use, and there are these three standards that are very specific. So being able to determine or clarify the meaning of unknown and multiple meaning, which are polysemous, now, now you know that fancy word, uh, words and phrases by using context clues, by analyzing meaningful word parts, and consulting general or specialized reference materials. Demonstrating understanding of figurative language, and then acquiring and using a range of general academic and domain specific language. And of course, science is just a wonderful context in which we can help students to really deepen their domain specific and disciplinary specific language. So what does research say? And I don't, I don't want to be redundant. We don't want to be redundant with information that you've already encountered in your conversations with Tanya. So we'll just go through this fairly quickly. But we know that vocabulary knowledge is strongly linked to reading comprehension, especially for emergent bilingual students. The interesting thing is, though, that these relationships are correlational in nature. They don't, we don't really know how it works. So there are many studies that talk about the fact that students who have difficulty with comprehension, very often when the vocabulary load is heavy, it constrains their comprehension. What we know less about is the direct effect of teaching vocabulary on comprehension. So that might sound counterintuitive, um, but that is the case, that we don't really know, we don't even know the most effective ways of teaching vocabulary. Uh, decades ago, we started doing studies of what happens if you do explicit teaching of vocabulary before students pick up a text. And we learned that that's really not very helpful at all. You can learn those words in isolation, and the readers don't bring them to bear, that knowledge to bear, when they're actually encountered in the text. So it's, it is a very thorny area. And that's because there's such an interesting relationship between vocabulary knowledge and comprehension. So there's the issue of word knowledge. There's the conceptual and cultural knowledge that children bring, or readers bring, learners. And then there are instructional opportunities. So all of these factors predict whether vocabulary is going to play a significant role in students' comprehension challenges. We do know this, though. We know that informal encounters with academic vocabulary are not enough to support word learning. So it is helpful to have the teacher point out that, ah, here's, an academic, here's a word that's going to be really helpful to your understanding. Pressure, force, energy. These are words that are going to be very helpful to your understanding. And we're going to stop and think about them and see how they're being used in this particular text. We know that students benefit when they are engaged, and this was Erica's point earlier, active processing of word meanings through multiple encounters and interactions with those words. The whole purpose there being to develop a deep knowledge of the vocabulary or the word meanings. 
We know that attention to word meanings and features in authentic contexts will make a difference. And so well-written trade books or other forms of text during read-alouds are exactly that kind of opportunity. The chance to connect known words to new words is another important instructional feature. Having instruction that's related to morphology, so you know, understanding root words, understanding words that are derived from Latin, Greek, uh, pointing out that hydro, right? Hydro, hydrofoil, hydropone, hydropower. So teaching students that hydro always has to do with water. And so teaching them those kinds of, whoops, <laughs> teaching them, uh, that's what I mean by morphology. And in science, we have wonderful opportunities to do that because science vocabulary is so often informed by uh, Greek and Latin terms. And then multiple opportunities to use those words in your reading, writing, listening, and speaking. One thing that we wanted to point out is the importance of providing students with what we call student-friendly or child-friendly definitions. And this is why your typical dictionary is not going to be helpful at all. Look at the difference between the traditional definition that you would get, for example, from, for the word dazzling. If you were to look this up, the definition would typically be something like, bright enough to deprive someone of sight temporarily. <laughs> like, well, okay, now I better look up <laughs> deprive, <laughs> and I'm gonna have to look up temporarily. But here's a student friendly. If something's dazzling, that means it's so bright you can hardly look at it. Another example, climate, the prevailing weather conditions of a particular region. Well, you could also say climate's the normal weather in a place or of a place. Contagious, <coughs> transmissible by direct or indirect comment, contact, communicable. Versus a contagious disease can be caught by touching people or things infected with the disease or sometimes by just getting close to them. So you see the difference between student-friendly versus traditional definitions. And this is sometimes, um, this is worthy of conversation with teachers because having the facility to come up with a child-friendly definition or a student-friendly definition, that takes some doing. Yeah. And if you try to do it on the spot, it can... It can often backfire, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, of course, there is the use of semantic maps or concept mapping. And in fact, there are some programs of science instruction. This comes from the work of Nancy Romance and Mike Vitale, who had a lot of success teaching students science ideas. In fact, that, that's the name of their intervention, science ideas, through the use of concept mapping. And so here you see, um, and appropriately enough, given our earlier discussion about coral reefs, this is a concept map that comes from their work on ecosystems. So you can see the high order of ecosystem is a relationship that occurs between, so you see how that's, how that's organized. But look at all the vocabulary that the students are being introduced to, right? herbivores, omnivores, carnivores, parasites. And in the, con in the um, process of constructing the, the concept map, you see in the ways in which you get examples, right? So parasites need hosts. Deer are an example of a host to a parasite. Tapeworms or deer may have tapeworms. So Right in the concept map, you see that kind of networking among the ideas to, again, provide some depth or richness to children's vocabulary knowledge. So we'll stop and take questions that you, that you have. I, and I, we don't know if this was useful, if it ex extended your understanding, or perhaps not. Yes, Richard. Um. So I have a question that goes back to the socio-cultural ring yes. of that. And you know, we know science is a traditionally male, white space. And I think it was you that said something that 612 Essentials about how we ask kids to code switch from class to class to class. Mm. Does that have to do with 
vocabulary as well? So it's, that's a really interesting point, and that goes back to the cultural knowledge, too, that was, that was up there. I think one of the interesting things and ways in which science teaching can, in fact, help us toward equity is that for almost all children or students with whom we're working, scientific discourse is fairly unique. And so we're all learning to become, if you will, multilingual when we learn how to use science vocabulary and scientific ways of, for example, constructing an explanation. So yes, I think that there, but I don't know that I would associate it necessarily in a culturally negative way. I would rather say, you know, here's an invitation to all of us to learn how to think and talk like scientists. And scientists do have very specific language that they use. And, and there's a very good reason why scientists are attentive. I remember having a discussion with a youngster where we were looking at, um, it was a matter and molecules unit. And the child was trying to describe what happens when a pot of water is on the top of the stove. And you see, you see the steam, you see something going on, you see the bubbles in the water, and the child said, well, you know, it's, I don't know, it's like condensation or distillation or evaporation or, you know, one of those, as though it didn't really matter what it was. And so part of what I think we're trying to communicate in science teaching is that the language does matter and that there's a particular language that we're going to, to learn as a community, and we're going to bring that language to our knowledge, to our um, science work. Does that, is that responsive to your? So I don't, I don't think of it as being a negative thing. I think of it as being a really wonderful opportunity for academic language acquisition. Other comments or questions? Online, someone shared the idea of using a uh, co-built um, dictionary. Have you ever heard of this? No. Does that just mean like a class constructed? Uh, yeah. Collins, CollinsSelf.com, co-built dictionary online. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's more of a, it's written more in student-friendly language. Ah, there are, there actually are some resources for generating. You could just Google uh, student-friendly definitions and there are several different resources that pop up. Maybe that m must be one of those. I'm just not familiar Even with it. Webster's, but I find that when you Google that, you still have to Do make a little. it more friendlier. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you can let us know later if you want more ideas or specific activities relative to vocabulary teaching, but we thought that maybe this would be a, just a little bit of a preview. Yeah, James? One thing that, that comes to mind is um, um, oftentimes we, we, we use the science as an opportunity to throw in additional vocabulary. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, I spoke to someone about um, well, some very young students uh, learning about clouds. And they said, well, kids can learn these big words like cumulonimbus, um, so why wouldn't I just teach them the words if they're ready for it? And to me, it, you know, I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not the, the, the person holding the knowledge here, but, um, but it seemed to me that, that, that it was almost senseless vocabulary and, you know, to go that way as well. So um, that's where I was trying to determine this balance. Um, when is it good to, you know, when should we push on these types of words? And then also, um, where does it fit in in my lesson sequence? Mm -hmm. You know, because I know, at least I recall anyway, I believe I recall that uh, some of the stuff I was taught early on with the Bob Marzano uh, was to put the vocabulary up front, we're going to do these, I think there were seven steps or something, and, you know, you know so you're making this vocabulary, this big mm -hmm. event that's forefronted, rather than what I've been learning more recently and that is to discover words um, as they're needed. You know, uh, where they've learned the context first and then you can attach the word, well, well, what might be another word we could use for this? You know, and that's when you bring in more science words. So there's, those are two different situations that, that, I, that I've, you know, uh, been thinking about. So I, I think it's a really helpful example and I, I fall on the side of if there's an appropriate word and the students are in a, the context where they're looking at the difference between uh, the various cloud types, 
I don't think there's any harm at all in saying to students, you might be interested to know scientists actually have names for these different clouds. And then you know, telling them what those names are mm -hmm. and illustrating them. They're going to encounter this multiple times. It's not that you're expecting that one exposure, they're going to take that away. But it creates a little, you know, oh, that's interesting. Scientists have specific names for specific cloud formations. So, and, and I actually, I think that we found in our work that students really derive a lot of pleasure from learning more powerful words. I like that. <laughs> Yep. And they've got to learn that vocabulary in just to hear it. Yep. Because when you're low income, you're not getting the vocabulary that other people are getting. So they need to hear that vocabulary, even if they're not requiring them to know that. They need to hear that. Yeah. And the, when I taught kindergarten, we, we did weather. They love meteorologists. They love those yes. people. And then we go home and they go, well, oh, I'm going to watch the meteorologist. And they come back. And, and think about all the kids that know all the dinosaur names. I think a really important point that you're bringing up is that there's a difference between words that we maybe want to expose students to and give them the opportunity to hear and think about mm -hmm. versus the words we might select for instruction that we know are going to provide a lot of utility, right? It, words that kids absolutely need to know in order to build those big ideas related to disciplinary core ideas, and not just words that kids need to know, but words that they need to be able to use in their talk and in their writing, mm -hmm. right, in particular. So I think that that's, there are different realms, different categories of vocabulary that we want to think about, while we wouldn't say, so if I have a particular text, right, coral reefs, I'm not going to necessarily teach students what an atoll is, and we may not write a definition for that or spend a lot of time talking about, let's compare the definitions of a coral atoll and these different types of coral, but that wouldn't be a reason that I would say, well, I can't use this text because these words are too hard right. and kids don't know them. But the words I might really focus on in a text like this that are really going to provide some usefulness for my science instruction and even my ELA instruction, depending on my goals, are those big ticket words like ecosystem, mm -hmm. right, and environment, and things that are really going to support students to use these words to apply to other ideas. Is that helpful to think about it in that way? So there are different ways that we want to address different words. It's not that as a teacher I would want to go through and say, these are the 20 challenging words. Okay, I want you to go write definitions of all of these words. It's really thinking strategically about when as a teacher I want to provide a just-in-time definition and this is enough of information for a student to help them make sense of this text versus these are words that I really want us to think about together so that you can use these words in your writing and in your talk and to help you communicate these big ideas too. So if I take what you just said and, and layer it onto what Anne Marie said about the clouds, Anne Marie was saying that in the context of students looking at different kinds of clouds, going outside and observing clouds on multiple days, drawing pictures of what they observe, that they might then be introduced to this idea that we have labels mm -hmm. that yeah. differentiate this cloud from this cloud in, in letters where you might have only learned so far to do it with your drawings. Because right. I'm in first grade and I don't know cumulonimbus. Mm -hmm. And that at some point maybe, that the kind of cloud indicates to us the kind of weather we're exactly. about to have. Exactly, that's where I because was going to go. that's the important part yep. of the standard. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter if they leave first grade being able to spell cumulonimbus, sure. but they should be able to walk out the front door and notice that there's mm -hmm. a big black clouds coming. We should take some measures. Yes, that, right? exactly. So you're, you're talking about like within the context of all of this and then the interactions, the relationship, those mm -hmm. words are the critical ones and the labels are in the sort of nice to know but not critical yet. In, in yeah, 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 and like you said, it totally depends on the context, yeah. right? And so which words are going to provide utility for us in this moment? So we have to be able to think about the different kinds of words that are going to really give us traction in certain instances. It's tricky. It at 
cumul cumulonimbus and all the other clouds words, and first graders would go out and use those words, but they wouldn't understand the reason why the clouds are different, or that the differences in clouds indicate mm -hmm. something. They to tell us, us something, and right? what that right, what the that helps us figure is, out. And, you know, kindergarten is not the time for why those clouds indicate different weather, but that the clouds indicate different weather. Those are the real mm -hmm. as evidence. That's really where the standard is. Because otherwise, you're going back to that risk that you just suggested that it's this or this or this. I don't know. It's one of those mm -hmm. words. It's a fancy word, and I can associate it with a particular right. um, subject or something. Um, and yeah, it's about understanding that those yes. that the clouds are there, that they are different, and that there is some reason behind why they're different. And right. right, their difference is significant. It and, tells and, us something. And maybe you get to the point where they, uh, you can say, yeah, they have different names too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. So I think we all understand that you know the word wall isn't that effective unless you're doing something with those words. Right. So are there any um, you know instructional strategies or tools that you've used that you have found particularly helpful? Like you know you were talking about uh, hearing those words or reading those words, but to maybe have access to tools where those words are visual in some way that they can use them when they're writing their notebooks mm -hmm. or their you know, having a conversation or discourses or any research that supports that? Right. You know what we should do is, that that would be something we can put together, is a, mm -hmm. a and set of... And Tanya uh, writes, in the essentials, there's a, you know, little yeah. well, essential on vocabulary, yep. which right. lays out some very explicit instructional strategies mm -hmm. around yeah. vocabulary. So, and I think, you know, those are, those can be integrated into any... In, 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 in Tanya, So mm -hmm. if you want, if there are kids that like the cumulus numbers, you can put mm -hmm. them in the cloud. That's your weather unit, and you can put different weather, like temperature and, yes. and meteorologist, and those words up. So if they want to write in their journal, they're there. Mm -hmm. And so that they're useful for those kids, and they have a picture to go with. We've seen some of the interactive word models mm -hmm. where they actually have like I was just going to say or that. A, a measuring cup or something right. that graphically or yes. physically represents the word, something like that. And shows the relationships among the words, which is right. part of what you're yeah. talking about as well. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the essentials, that makes sense, but I don't think, um, for us, uh, I'll speak for myself as a science person, I would, I would need a little bit better connection between those instructional strategies and science. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's we can work that up. A couple of things online. Great. Um, one of them uh, suggests that they might want to push back a little on using the big words. My kiddo loves that she can spell thermodynamics. However, I'm not sure if she understands the concept of a word. It really <laughs> needs to be in context for a purpose. And I think uh, this is being addressed right now. Okay. And then someone else uh, said that um, one of the mistakes that people are still making about vocabulary is that kids are being forced to copy definitions. And they're suggesting a resource that we use uh, might be this book. Uh, no more look up the list mm -hmm. vocabulary instruction. Yep, <laughs> Camille Blackowitz. Yeah, that we were thinking that we would put together, compile some resources like that, and we just didn't get it done for this meeting. That's on me. <laughs> that, was, that was on my list of things to do. So we'll get working on that. There's one more thing online. Uh, they said. We're still waiting to hear about the magic school bus. <laughs> oh, they want to hear more about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but they want to hear like what made the difference? Oh, like uh, for those. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can go back there because <laughs> I have my little my little crib notes on that. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> oh, this is quite the... <laughs> okay, there, there it is. is, there it is. Oh. No, you're going the right way. Okay. Keep going to the right. There we go. Okay, all right. I just needed to be here so that I could look at my notes. 
So these were the, these were the practices that made the, dis the difference between students who learned from the magic, the four teachers whose practices actually led to learning. The first thing that they did is they read any running page first, all right? So the running page, meaning the, the page that has the largest block of text. Then those teachers read the speech balloons that are pretty typical of the magic school bus. So here you have, uh, here's a speech balloon. Your future looks cloudy, so does Venus. And then some of these pages actually have, so this would be the running text right there. And then the reports would, were read third. And this would be an example of a report. Why are Venus's clouds yellow? In other words, they made these texts more coherent or cohesive by first reading through the running text, then going to these kinds of balloons. We're gaining weight, and we haven't even had lunch. We'll be heavier here than on the moon or Mercury because Venus has more gravity. And then, so reading through those, discussing those, and then up to the reports, what are called reports, which are typically represented with these little uh, three-ring binder paper reports. So that, that made a difference. That was on a page-by-page page basis? Yes. All of the running text through the whole book and then come back? Page no, it was a page-by-page. Page. Yep. Yep. Good question, though. And that made a difference. Can you rehash what the difference is that it made? So the, the difference is that the students whose teachers engaged in that kind of systematic use of the Magic School Bus, they learned more of the content than the students whose teachers were more random with respect to how they took the students through the the book. And is that suggested in the book somewhere? So no. <laughs> I don't think it, I don't need to laugh. And this isn't is unique to the Magic School Bus, right? We've encountered many texts like this, yeah. uh, science texts, that but are kind of all over the place. Did, yeah. did they figure that out or did they just do that happenstance and then the results? The, this was a natural study. It was not an instructional study. It was just a naturalistic 12 teachers all using the Magic School Bus. What do they do with it? And then did it make a difference? So that's what we're reporting to so you. So the researchers found that backwards. That's right. At the teacher practices, those folks did it this way. And their they students learned more. No. That's correct. Well, that's that's correct. correct. Can you go through that order one more time? Mm -hmm. Sure. So reading through the running text, followed by the speech bubbles, followed by these mini reports. And as Miranda said, uh, this is not, uh, while it's kind of, it's classically identified with the Magic School Bus, bus text, we see many examples of these kinds of hybrid texts uh, as we look at different trade books. Well, even their magazines, like Scholastic. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. all have those on each page. Yeah, but learned more doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean learned a lot. No. <laughs> right? I mean, it could still be that these are an impediment to learning, but the teachers who got the most out of it did it in this way. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. That's, a, that's an important <laughs> distinction. Dude, I hate those books. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> what do you think is the reason behind it? What's the... I, th I think what... So Smolkin and Donovan were the researchers who did this work. And their explanation actually ties back to what we've been saying about trying to teach for coherence. That their, that practice or that sequence was, brought the most coherence to this particular unusually strange or unusually mixed text. Think about it, it does kind of follow what we've been talking about in science instruction, right? There's a story, mm -hmm. so read the story first. Then you talk about the story, so there's your speech bubbles, and then you get to this content or vocabulary piece last. Uh huh. So that yeah, that's a good kind of that's a good analysis. <laughs> but you're still not. Mary's worried that you're advocating for this. <laughs> <laughs> no one's sure why. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> the only reason that we put that slide in there is because we wanted to make the point that it's, um, you, you can't just ask questions about the text that you're choosing, it's also about how the text is enacted. And so this was our classic example of, yeah, the enactment makes a difference. That's, that was the point. So shall we move Any on? Final questions about vocabulary? I can do that. Okay, sorry, yeah. Any final questions about vocabulary to we, before we move to our last portion for today? Yes. Would you ever select a text just based on the vocabulary uh, benefits alone, or is that really almost always a secondary purpose of, or uh, secondary criteria for selecting a text? So, well, let me take a first you know? pass at that. I. Being thoughtful about the vocabulary in selecting a text is sensible because if there are so many unfamiliar words, so many words, at the and there's not enough context to support the student to make sense of that word, that's probably not going to be a good choice of, of text. On the other hand, if, and the vocabulary should be it, that it enriches the concepts, right? That it's, it's giving students a language for talking about ideas in a way that's really generative and flexible. So I wouldn't steer away from a book because there's novel or challenging vocabulary, but I would also be mindful of, is the vocabulary presented in a fashion that's helpful to students? And is there a reasonable amount of what's <coughs> unlikely to be, or what's likely to be unfamiliar to the students? Because you certainly, if if the vocabulary load is so extreme, it's definitely going to be an impediment to comprehension. And you don't want to find yourself in a position where you're continuously having to stop, let's figure out what that word means. So I don't know if, if that's a helpful response, but OK. Thank you. So the last, um, the last thing we want to dive into you into with with you today is um, thinking about we spent a lot of time this morning and early afternoon thinking about our more traditional texts that we use in instruction and in science instruction right these narrative informational or hybrid texts they can be trade books they can be articles they can be texts that you access online but print based text in particular but we also know that there are other important types of modes or multimodal texts that are used in science and can support students' science learning. More and more, we see the use of video in classrooms. And so teachers need support in thinking about ways to optimally use and integrate video into science instruction. There are also opportunities for incorporating audio into science instruction. So in this particular picture, you see this comes from, I think, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology bird calls that students could listen to as a form of audio. There are opportunities for students to examine um, images. So in this particular uh, image, might be useful for analyzing squirrel structures that support them to do particular things. There are graphical representations, so students can be supported to interpret graphs that support their science learning, as well as simulations that are interactive that students could work with digitally to also support science learning, as well as multimodal science texts that can incorporate a variety of these. We were talking about hyperlinks a little bit earlier, which per also incorporate unique challenges and opportunities for students' science learning. So when we talk about multimodal science texts and the range of science texts, these are some of the things that we're talking about in addition to our more traditional trade books that we might use in science instruction or our articles similar to some of the ones that we looked at today. And so one um, type of text that we've been exploring the use of in our work is the use of simulations and also how we can support teachers to optimally support students to use and learn from simulations, especially when they're paired with their firsthand investigations as well as other texts. And so the simulation that we're going to look at together today comes from, and I'll tell you how to navigate there in just a second, the FET simulations. And this one in particular is the Force and Motions ba Force and Motion Basics. And students use this simulation to think 
more deeply and to continue investigating the ideas of balanced and unbalanced forces. So when students use this, they use it very closely to when they have read and analyzed the Lonnie Johnson text, which has opportunities for students to really think about um, balanced and unbalanced forces and what that means and how those work. And so we think of this text as providing particular opportunities for students to go deeper into some of those ideas and really have a rich visual of what it might look like. And so what I would like for you to do is, it looks like most people have a computer in front of them. I'll show you where to go to access this text. I think I can just click. Yes, I can. So if you go to Google and just type in P-H-E-T, force in motion, I'll do that with you. The very first thing that should come up is forces and motion basics. And once you get there, if you click on the farthest one to the left, the net force, it'll take you to the simulation that you can interact with. And one of the things, as we look at this simulation and think about how teachers might use this simulation with their students to support them to really build knowledge and think about using this as a text, the questions, hold on, oh, it wasn't even showing them where I was going. You didn't tell me. <laughs> oh, but, just but your on directions that screen. were great. I found it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, does anybody need more instruction to get here? Excellent. I'll go back to the slides. I thought that I was kind of guiding oh. you through on my screen of exactly how to do it, and that wasn't the case. No. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is just kind of explore this simulation, see how it works. Start thinking about what teachers, why isn't this working? Um, there we go. Um, so take about five minutes on your own or fewer than that because I think you'll orient pretty quickly. What are some of the learning opportunities with this simulation? What about using and understanding the simulation might be challenging for young students? And what supports might teachers need to use this simulation successfully with their students? So these are kind of your guiding questions. Take just a few minutes on your own to explore the simulation, see if you can figure out how it works, and then talk through these questions with the people at your table, and we'll debrief about the ways that we've been thinking about supporting teachers to use this particular type of multimodal text of a simulation that's interactive with their students to support science learning. All right, let's come back together for just a minute and gather some of your noticings, and then Anne Marie is going to share a video with you of one of the teachers in the Multiple Literacies Project getting students ready to work with this simulation. So what are some of the things that you notice? Maybe opportunities, challenges, or supports that you think teachers might need to teach with this very different kind of text than the traditional kinds of text that we think about. What were some of your noticings? Opportunities, challenges, or supports you think teachers might need? Yes? Uh, I really like the, the explorative nature, right? That, that you're kind of figuring stuff out. You're not, you're not <laughs> following a recipe. Right. Mm -hmm. So opportunities for inquiry and exploration because of that interactive nature of it, right? What else did you notice? Opportunities, challenges, or supports that teachers might need? So even at your table, when you were individually exploring the simulation, it gave you opportunities to want to talk and compare and say, well, this is what happened when I did this, or what happened when you did this. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So even without specific prompts in that instance, right, it provides, it encourages conversation. Okay, so you found that you all were generating questions as you looked at the simulation. Like what? Can you give me an example of some questions you had? Well, well, there were a couple maybe that least in my mind. I was like, I, I thought it was going to work a little differently than it did. Mm -hmm. So I 
I'm not sure I'm totally convinced by some of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a yeah, so we, you want another investigation? Yes. Right. So are you seeing ways that a teacher could use this um, in the classroom to really support students to design and conduct their own investigations using fair tests? Yes, as a springboard. So. Great. Mm -hmm. What else? Lots of why questions. Why did this mm. work? Do you want to show them the video? Sure. See? We thought maybe you'd enjoy seeing a glimpse of a third grade teacher who's using the video. She's introducing the children to this simulation. Um, they, this is done in the context of the toy unit, the force in motion unit. And so this is the student's first experience with the simulation. And also I should tell you that this teacher said that after this year's experience that to, to your point about exploration, who, who, who have you made that comment that it's a, it was a good context for exploration, Mike? She said that she would uh, designate some time for students to go off and do some exploration before she had this conversation with them. So in this one, this is one of the first times she was using the simulation. It's not super clear, but I think you'll be able, oh, I don't know what audio will be like, but we'll see what will happen. <laughs> oh. It it's work. really it clear, might work. so. Yeah, but it's not really loud. Well, let's, let's try it and where, see. Where is it online? Is, is the video on the resources folder? Oh, we could put it there. Would that be easier? Yeah. Uh, it might be. But the remote we'll try it. Folder see it see, what, see okay, what you can hear. Let's see what you can hear. It doesn't even reach. No, I know. That's why we have to just, let's just try it and see. No way. Applying this to science and what we've learned. Turn it up. Um, Lexi, I think my mouth is, is loud enough. Because they're both the same exact size. There's no way. You can't okay, hear. Okay, so Lexi, I, I heard say they're not going to okay. move. They've got the same amount of, of strength on each side of that rope. Raise your hand if you agree with that. Thumbs up if you agree. Thumbs down if you think no. I think one's going to pull it further. And not only did Lexi tell us what she thought was going to happen, but she explained why. Well, I think it's not going to move because, and then she included some of those science work. There's the same force on each side. Is anything happening? No. Okay. So. Again, it was just to give you a glimpse. You'll notice the way in which the teacher tacks back to and acknowledges the student for using the, the language that she's been introducing them to, balanced and unbalanced forces. Um, so that was it. Any observations or comments or questions? I just to tell them why. Why, because yes. I think that's the missing step. That's sometimes right. To really get that, make that thinking visible. Exactly. That's right. At the very beginning, thank you for pointing that out. At the very beginning, she said, not only does she tell us which one she thinks, but she tells us why. And then she encourages, Ms. Lado encourages the students to always tell why they think it's going to happen in a particular way. 
So one of my last questions, just about, about this, right? I know today we just looked at the simulation, which is only one kind of multimodal text that we can use to support student science and literacy learning. Are there particular types of supports that you think are different from the kinds of supports that we provide teachers for more traditional texts that would be important to provide for a text like this that's very different from the kind of text that teachers are maybe more used to using in the classroom? Or do you find that it's pretty, teachers use these kinds of things pretty intuitively? Yes? I think sometimes there's a, um there's a lack of explaining the science follow through. So in seventh and eighth grade, eighth grade, we used to use uh, aliens who drank a, from a liquid, and you had to figure out the basic or the mm. acidic liquid mm -hmm. by killing off your aliens, in effect, or making them live. Um, and it was great, and the kids had a great time, but there was a lack of explaining or making connections afterwards mm -hmm. or helping kids to make the connections. I think that's a danger. So maybe to your point about the why. Right, so maybe those kind of supports for discussion and debriefing those activities more than, as opposed to kind of approaching it as a game. Mm -hmm. You wanted to add something? I just want to say that you might need some extra attention to the unique text features that right. students might not be super familiar yes. with. So what are those little check boxes? Hey, they turn things on and off to make sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. So like orientation to, in this case, the particular simulation and the different features, right? What role do each of the components play and what are the different parts of the simulation? We have the rope that is really important in the middle that kind of stays stable until you do something to the simulation to change the forces that are acting upon that rope, right? And then the parts in the top where you can turn on indicators of speed and indicators of the sum of the forces and values. And you may have particular instructional goals where students either need some of those on or they don't need some of those turned on in order to support their thinking and to figure out the big ideas that you're trying to support them to figure out. Yes? I, if I were teaching that, I think the teacher commented that when she did it again, she didn't introduce it, she let the kids She let the kids it. explore first. So I would prefer to let just give the kids a simulation, have them work with it, and then draw out oh, what does this button do, what does that button do, mm -hmm. and discover. Yeah. So even letting the kids explore and kind of try to figure out what those different components do and how, yes. it, how it works too. She, she would agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So as we're wrapping up for today, one of the things that we wanted to, to share with you are just some of the sources that we turn to when we're looking for texts that we think are particularly useful or have particularly good resources. One of the first tech, one of the first resources is, I'm not sure how familiar you are with these lists, but the Outstanding Science Trade Books for Students K-12. The NSTA produces um, a list, a compilation of these resources every year. And so I believe they span from books released from 1996 and then the 2019 list was just, um, released very recently. For all of these, I also uploaded into your file with embedded links, a chart that has all of these listed in there and brief descriptions about what they contain. So I think if you're looking for trade books, this is a great place to start. The only downfall of this is it doesn't do that text analysis for you. It doesn't tell you the disciplinary core ideas or specific practices or cross-cutting concepts that those are aligned to. So that still puts the work of doing that on the audience. The books that it does include are typically very rich, though. Except for they do have yes. teaching through trade books, which they do connect specifically to. In that history. separate resource? Uh, it's in every issue. Oh, OK. They focus on a K2 text and then a 3-5 text, and then they, they link it to the prospect concept. Oh, excellent. And core ideas and for every one or just for a select? Uh, do you know? Not necessarily off of that list. Oh, OK. A separate resource. Issue. Excellent, that's perfect, thank you. We can add that to the list. What did you say that was called? Teaching Through Trade Books. Teaching Through Trade Books, great. Um, and then the other resources that we put on here are all, we included because they're free, which we know is really important. Um, so a couple of resources for digital texts 
our ReadWorks is a digital library of text that has both informational and narrative text that are searchable by grade level, by lexile, I believe, by topic area, by discipline. A teacher can create an account in that, and those are, in, I think, increasing in quality, and more and more they're partnering with, um, with organizations like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology or the National Museum of History. And so I think that that's really increased the, um, the quality of especially their science texts. And those also have ways that students can log on and interact with those texts as well. So that's another source that has a digital library of texts. Similarly, um, Epic is a site that a lot of the teachers that we've worked with have used and are really thrilled about because it provides access to ebooks. And so they're just available digitally. So an example, and pretty current, one example of an ebook that's on there is that Lonnie Johnson, you saw a picture of it earlier, the Super Soaker trade book and it's there in full form right so kids can go through many of the text can be read aloud to the students so they can kind of just play it and the pages turn again teachers can create an account for free and this is just another digital library with ebooks as well as videos and other um, sources of text there too this um, stamp of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is just an example of one kind of science website that, can, that students can use information from and learn from. The link that we put in the resource with the table is, I believe, to the American Library Association, has a compilation of websites that are particularly well stu suited to support student learning. It has sections for science specifically, but it also spans across disciplines. We looked at in that simulation comes from FET Interactive Simulations, which contains several math and science related simulations, again, that are free for teachers and students. Another source for simulations and other science related resources is the Concord Consortium. And finally, a particularly useful site for video resources is TED-Ed. And that's another one that's just a digital library of videos that can be sorted by grade level and topic and things like that. Any question about other resources? Yes? Online, someone suggests using NCSS. It does the same thing as the NSTA with trade books. Oh, great. And both lists are excellent. Wonderful. NCSS, you said? Mm -hmm. All right, that down so I'll forget. OK, great. Thank you. Any questions about? I was just looking at Epic. Is it, it looks like it's free for educators. It is free for educators, yes. It is free. You just have to put in your information and select your school. It'll pop up, and then it's totally free. And what it does, if you want your students to log on, so each teacher enrolled gets a little pin that you can just give your students and they can log in. You can also create a classroom. And some of these link up with Google Classroom if teachers are using those as well, which is really nice. Yes? Yes, I think that's true. There were some really good ones in there, really interesting too for kids. Any other comments or questions about resources? And I think we're ready to transition into kind of wrapping up and doing some evaluations and surveys. And I think Mary's going to kind of do a little prelude to what's going to happen tomorrow so that you have a preview of that and know the thinking that you should be doing tonight before you come back. Awesome. All right.